Hey there everybody, Mr. Marek here. In this video, we are learning about the magnetic forces on charges. Um, this was discovered in some, sometime in the 19th century that a magnetic field could exert forces on objects that weren't magnets. And it was discovered that these objects were always charged. And so we can safely claim that charges will experience magnetic forces. The key thing, though, is that the charges have to be moving. If the charge is at rest, then a magnetic field doesn't, inf doesn't affect it. So the charges have to be moving through a magnetic field, and they'll only experience a force when they're moving perpendicular to the magnetic field. <clears throat> so there's a lot of conditions that are necessary in order for a magnetic field to exert a force. Have to be working with a charge, that charge has to be moving, and that charge has to be moving perpendicular to the magnetic field. So if we draw a magnetic field going to the right like that, and then we draw a couple of charges, if the charge on the left is moving upwards and the charge on the right is moving to the right, only the charge on the left is going to have a magnetic force on it because it's moving perpendicular to the magnetic field. The charge on the right will not have a magnetic force on it. The magnetic field won't affect that charge at all. It's kind of a weird thing, but that's the way that it works. Moving parallel to a magnetic field doesn't affect a charge at all. If we were to draw another charge in there at rest, it would not be affected either. So the first thing we need to learn about this force is what its direction is. And again, this is a little bit different. The magnetic force is always perpendicular to both, keyword both, the velocity of the charge and the magnetic field. So kind of going back to our example here, where we've got a charge moving upwards and a magnetic field directed to the right. The magnetic field again to the right. The velocity is upwards. The question is, what is a direction that is perpendicular to both? So what's a direction that's perpendicular both to up and to right? And the answer is the third dimension, either into the page, or in this case a screen, or out of the page. And so instead of thinking just in the x and y direction, we also need to think in the z direction. And so typically when we're working on a piece of paper, the z direction is in and out of the piece of paper. So, some ways that we can um, indicate arrows that go in and out of a page on a piece of paper. An arrow going into the page is designated by an X. An arrow going out of the page is designated by a dot. And those come from like little literal arrows. If you were to take a bow and use it to shoot an arrow, as it traveled away from you, you would just see the back of the arrow. So you would see like the little cross feathers, and so it would look like an X. If you were in the unfortunate situation of having an arrow shot at you, all you would see would be the pointy front of it. So you would see a dot. So those symbols come from, you know, like a literal arrow. Think about a three-dimensional arrow. So in order to determine which way it actually is, so we've narrowed it down to two directions, um, we would use a rule called the right-hand rule. So we have several right-hand rules that we need to be able to use. This is the one that allows us to find the direction of a magnetic force. So here's how it works. You can abbreviate right-hand rule RHR if you want, because that's hard to spell. And we use this again to determine the direction of the magnetic force on a positive charge. So keyword positive. So the first thing that you're going to do is you're just going to orient your right hand so that your thumb, index, and middle finger are all perpendicular to each other. Physically, how you would do that? Well, point your thumb and your index finger like you're going to make an L. And then extend your middle finger straight out from the palm of your hand. And so make an L with your thumb and um, pointer finger and then just kind of uncurl the middle finger so that it's pointing straight out from your palm. So your hand's going to end up looking something like that. So when you hold your hand that way, 
your fingers represent the three vectors that are involved in this situation. Your thumb represents the velocity of the charge. You can kind of think about it like you're hitchhiking. You point your thumb in the direction you're going. So the thumb points the direction that you're going, the charge is going. The index finger represents the magnetic field. And so the B, the magnetic field, is represented by your pointer finger. And then your middle finger represents the magnetic force. And so going back to our example, the way we would determine the direction of the magnetic force is we would point our thumb towards the top of the screen. That's the direction that the charge is moving. We would point our index finger to the right, because that's the direction of the magnetic field. And so when we do that, we ask ourselves which way does our middle finger end up pointing. So there's only one way that we can hold our hand so that the thumb points upwards and the pointer finger, the index finger, points to the right. That means that your middle finger is pointing towards the screen. And so when we were, if we were to write this in like a piece of paper, we would say that the force is into the page. So this charge is feeling a force directed into the page. So let's look at a few examples. So that series of X's represents a magnetic field going into the page, and we've got a charge moving to the right. And so you would point your thumb to the right, then you would turn your hand so that your pointer finger is pointing into the screen, and when you do that, your middle finger should be pointing upwards. And so the magnetic force is upwards. In this example, the dots represent a magnetic field coming out of the page, and the charge is still moving to the right. So now instead of orienting your hand so that your pointer finger is pointing into the screen, you would turn it 180 degrees so that your pointer finger is pointing out of the screen. And so when you do that, you hold your hand correctly, your middle finger should be pointing down, so the force is down. In this example, we've got a magnetic field going to the right, and we've got a charge moving to the right. Now before you go trying to point both your thumb and your index finger in the same direction like that, remember that if, there's, if they are parallel to each other, there's no force. So in this situation, there wouldn't be a force. In this situation, we have a magnetic field going to the right, we have um, the velocity going upwards, and so point your thumb up, index finger to the right, now your pointer or your middle finger should point into the page, so it would look like that. In this example, we've got a magnetic field going upwards, we've got a negative charge which is moving to the right. So when you point your thumb upwards, pointer, excuse me, thumb to the right, pointer finger upwards, your middle finger should extend out of the page. However, since it is a negative charge, we do the opposite. So if our right hand rule tells us that the force is out of the page, then for a negative charge, the force would be into the page. So looking at another example, got a magnetic field going into the page, a charge moving to the right, so thumb goes to the right, pointer finger goes into the page, your middle finger would be pointing up, but because it's a negative charge, the force is actually going down. So the right hand rule kind of takes a little bit of practice, but once we get it figured out, then it should be a relatively easy thing for us to do. So let's talk next about the size of the magnetic force. The size of the force depends on three things. Number one is the size of the charge, like how many coulombs of charge. Number two is the velocity of the charge, how fast it's going. And number three is the size of the magnetic field. And remember we use the symbol B for magnetic field. 
And so the force is just equal to those three things multiplied together. Now notice that both the velocity and the magnetic field are vectors. In AP2, this is the first time we've encountered a situation where we have to multiply two vectors together. Oftentimes, it's going to be written like this. And the way that that's read is it's QV cross B, which is a calculus notation which indicates the cross product. And so if you're familiar with the cross product, um, either you're taking calculus-based physics or you're in calculus right now, um, you may see it written like that. Cross product just means we have to use the right-hand rule to determine the direction of the force. Um, by the way, there's several different ways to um, do the right-hand rule. Um, many people teach it differently than what I do. Any way that you learn it is okay, you just have to make sure that you're being consistent. Um, so as long as it gives you the right answer, any system really will work. So if what I'm telling you today is different than what you've learned in the past, that's okay. You can still do what you may have learned in calculus or whatever. So, how do charges move in a magnetic field? Here we've got to go back to what we learned last year. The force, again, and the velocity are always perpendicular to each other. So, when force and velocity are perpendicular to each other, that means that the force is centripetal, meaning it's going to make it move in a circle. Remember that centripetal forces don't change the speed of the object, they just change its direction. And so if I kind of draw another simple example, so we've got a magnetic force field, magnetic field going into the page, and a positive charge moving to the right. So if you do your right-hand rule, you would find that the force is upwards, so upward force. And so since those two are perpendicular to each other, that means the object's going to turn in a circle. And since the force is upwards, the charge is going to move in a circle going upwards. So a few seconds later, maybe the charge is right there. And so if you do the right-hand rule again, now that it's moving up, just turn your thumb upwards, you would get the force to be to the left. And so it would continue, if, it, if the magnetic field were large enough, it would continue to move in that circular path until it came back to the beginning point, in which case it would do it again, or it left the magnetic field. And so if you've got an electron, or a proton, or any charge in a magnetic field that's large enough, you can basically trap that thing in there forever. That's one way of how we are trying to make um, nuclear fusion work here on Earth to get like electricity from. Um, we try to use magnetic fields to make it move, the plasma or whatever, move in a circle. And so there's lots of uses to this idea that charges will move in a circle in a magnetic field. So remember from last year that the centripetal force would be mass times centripetal acceleration. And remember, centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So let's look at an example problem together. Suppose that we have a proton whose velocity is 2 times 10 to the fourth meters per second, and it's moving perpendicular to a 0.2 Tesla magnetic field. And we want to know how wide it's going to turn, like what the radius it's going to move through. So here we have to recognize that the magnetic force is centripetal, and then the magnetic force is QVB, centripetal force is MV squared over R, and then we just need to go and solve this for R. So canceling out some Vs, and then I'd multiply both sides by R to get rid of the fraction and then divide by QB. And so plugging in our numbers, the mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. If you don't have that memorized, it's on your formula chart. You need to look it up. We're given the velocity. Same thing with the charge. If we don't remember it, we can look it up. It's 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And then our magnetic field, and that should give you something like 1 times 10 to the negative third meters. So there's lots of cool uses for this magnetic force business. Um, for instance, we can use it to figure out how big molecules and atoms are. 
um, something we'll look at in class next time. Um, and it's also useful for understanding how the Earth's magnetic field protects us from harmful radiation from the sun. Something we'll also try to talk about in class next time. So, until then, ta-ta.